Welcome to the Bear Archery Podcast. I'm joined by Luke Johnson, the man behind the blade at Tito Knives. Yeah, I used to say Tito Knives, but I was wrong all of that time. Guys, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about, um, well, we start by talking about the importance of getting kids involved into sports um, and how it helps them mature and grow as people. Uh, We talk about Tito Knives and how they came about and um, the development of the knives over the years. We talk about the knife system that each one of us run, why we run it that way. Um, you know, I'm gearing up for spring bear. So kind of everything about my system right now is spring bear related. Uh, so we talk about our, our knife system and what we run that way. Um, but we also dive into kind of our favorite hunts uh, over the years. And we talk about kind of the maturing of sportsmen and what that looks like and, and things that we go through to mature as outdoorsmen and sportsmen. Guys, it's a fun episode. Um, I hope you enjoy it. As always, this episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Scentlock. But guys, Luke Johnson and Tito Knives, let's jump right in. With over 90 years of innovation, Bear Archery continues pushing toward the goal of founder, Fred Bear, making archery accessible for all. Fred believed the history of the bow and arrow for the history of mankind, and everyone should immerse themselves in the outdoor experience. Welcome to the Bear Archery Podcast, where the mission is simple, to hunt, grow, and inspire others. Guys, if you're a traditional archer and you have not checked out Three Rivers Archery, what are you waiting for? Three Rivers Archery is your one-stop shop for all things traditional archery. They have the largest in-stock selection of of traditional archery equipment anywhere. Same-day shipping, very, very, very knowledgeable. Listen, I use Three Rivers all the time. If I've got a question on tuning, if I've got a question on broadheads, if I've got a question on brace height or anything like that, I use Three Rivers for everything. They know the products because they use the products. Three Rivers Archery is by far the gold standard when it comes to traditional archery. So guys, if you're just getting into traditional archery, I would encourage you to use Three Rivers as a resource for knowledge and understanding and growing and learning and as a place to get all those products that you're going to be needing as you take this journey. All right, Luke, the, uh, the man behind the blade. I don't, I, that sounded way too markety, but, um, (laughs) sounded cool, I guess, but man, how's life, how's life going for you, dude? Good. Things are going good. Uh, busy, busy. Uh, Yeah. It's, it's better to be busy than bored. I've learned that though. That is true. The alternative to busy is usually not good. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, either either that means you're just lazy or it means things aren't going how they need to be going. That's that is true. That is true. But, uh, you know, they say get a job or start a company in the hunting industry and uh, you'll get to hunt a lot less. Um, Yeah. So I've been learning that. (laughs) Yep. That's how it goes, dude. People. It's my favorite thing. The misconception of you get to hunt for a living. And I'm like, no. It's the furthest from the truth. You work in the hunting industry. doesn't mean you hunt for a living. Like, no. no, I mean, our busiest time is obviously during the hunting season. Oh, yeah. When I want to sure. be out and about, I mean, and it goes even for spring hunting seasons, too. So we get busy in the spring, and then we get busy in the fall. And, you know, I used to, I suppose, in my heyday when I was in my mid-20s, I got to hunt, oh, some years, even like 60 days a year. And I'm uh, not even close to that now, I'll tell you that. Yeah. So. Now, where are you at in the world? What, what what part of the country are you from? Uh, Minnesota. So we are like the northwest suburbs of Minnesota. Very cool. How far are you from Alexandria? Uh, about an hour 15 or so south of Sweet, Alexandria. Sweet, dude. Yeah. May 18th, put it down. Uh, Pope and Young has a uh, one of our bow hunter bashes, which is like a day event. Super fun. We've partnered up with the guys at uh, – at dialed archery um so they're going to be doing their day event and we're going to be having a banquet after that and just some really good food um auction items just giveaways it'll be a fun night so uh, that's in alexandria on may 18th so uh i'll uh hope to see you there for sure is that at the arrowwood resort up there 
No, it's at the Alexandria Shooting Park. Okay. Is what it's okay. called. Cool. Yep, I've never been there. Um, I try to stay out of Minnesota. It's too cold and snowy for me. But It is. We had no. a very odd winter this year. We, it was like Christmas. It was raining and 55 degrees, which is just unheard of. We're usually locked in snow all year. We maybe yep. got two little snowstorms, and they both disappeared right away. It was uh, yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that's what's crazy. You know, I'm here in Kansas and we get some some decent snows, but never, you know, never anything crazy. And you talk to people from that part of the world and they're like, dude, it's 55 and sunny. And I'm like, dude, it's negative 20. Like yeah. we swapped weather here. And so it was definitely weird. And I remember there being times like I thought, oh, snap, like we have a massive cold front coming in and the deer hunting is going to be insane. Or we have a big snow coming in. The deer hunting is going to be insane. But it was almost like it was too much for the deer. Like it's almost like it it skipped their norm for cold fronts and snow, so it almost like shocked them. You know what I mean? Yeah, they just uh, I don't know. They probably just bedded down and waited it out or something like yeah. that. It didn't get them moving like it usually would. Um, you know, it's funny. As soon as you said I'm my son's hockey coach, I'm like, I bet this Doug's from Minnesota, dude, because <laughs> yeah. they're all about hockey. Hockey's kind of a religion up here. I'll tell you that. Yeah. It's. Uh, People are crazy about it. I played hockey growing up as a kid and thought that I played a lot. My eight year old is, I mean, he's playing year round. So it's, dude, uh, it's insane. It's it really crazy. is insane. Like, how, and hey, good for them. Like, it, it makes me excited, like, to see kids, you know, getting so passionate about stuff. But, dude, my 12 year old's like, hey, we've got a game seven hours away and we've got a tournament that is going to last 19 hours a day for four weeks. And I'm like, What's going on here? Like, yeah. you're 12. Yeah. Like, but man, that's what, like, the, the the tone of sports have just changed. And even, like, my son last year was four playing t-ball. And I'm like, wait, we got two practices a week. And, you know, when I was in t-ball, it was like we show up for an hour before the game and then we play the game. Like, yeah. you know, but now it's like, and hey, good for them. Like, I, I hope – I hope that that passion and that drive to to succeed and to excel will transfer over into you know kids wanting to become successful in the field and hunting and um, which I've seen it in my kids like I've seen that I've seen that in my kids you know my five year old like dude he'll stick it out through cold fronts and he'll yeah. stick it out for hours sitting in a blind and yeah, hopefully I mean, it transfers it's over. It's going two different ways. There's you know part of the kids that I'm seeing that are locked to their devices and watching tv and playing video games and that's all they do all day and then there's the other half that are you know going hard on whatever activity they're doing um yeah. sports outdoors all that kind of stuff so um i think a lot of it has to do with parents i mean it's easy to hand your kid a tablet or a video game and you know don't pay attention to them um uh, probably cheaper too <laughs> than getting <laughs> into thinking, all the sports it doesn't take up <laughs> your time but uh no it seems to be going two different ways in my opinion but i don't know i've been impressed with a lot of the the younger people and the kids um that i've seen lately um for sure getting after it you know i've had high school age kids uh work for me part-time full-time whenever they can um just a few people that i i know um and you know the younger generation has got a bad rap of being lazy and that kind of thing but man some of the kids i see they're uh they're gung-ho they come into work they work their ass off all day and uh you know they're happy about it so and that that truly is man that's the benefit of sports like sports will teach a kid so much and and you know i'm not even talking about hunting i'm talking about actual team sports yeah it teaches a kid so much man and so much value and so much hard work and so much you know and i try to tell my kid and people are like oh you're so hurtful and i'm like no i'm i'm truthful like sweetheart you're not the best right but you're also not the worst like yeah. you're not as good as you think you are but hey you're also not as bad as you think you are and I want them to just learn that mentality, not only for sports, but for life. Like, don't get on a high horse thinking you're better than everybody else. But, hey, man, pick your head up because you're not as bad as you think you are either. Like, and it just teaches them so much. And and even since, you know, even since, even since my 12-year-old started sports, it's like, 
you see the way they handle emotions better. You see the way they they interact with authority better because they've learned to respect that authority, you know, as a coach. And and so it it does a lot of good for a man. So I would encourage everybody. Like, I know it's expensive. I know, dude, stinking. It's insane. Like summer leagues is like 400 bucks. And I'm like for volleyball, like anyways, uh, but it teaches them so much, man. It's so much value in, in what they're doing. So yeah, get a kid uh, signed up translates to the real world. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to have to deal with bosses, other authority. You're going to have to learn to work with, uh, you know, other people, whatever you have to do. Um, like my son, my eight year old son, he's played hockey with, all kinds of kids. I mean, he's got a core team that he kind of sticks with, but like he's in camps and stuff all over. So he's dealing with new kids, new coaches, new people all the time. And it's just been really good for him. So I think yeah. it translates to the real world big time. Yeah, for sure. No, and you're right, man. Some kids just, it's so easy to just write off. Like, and just say this generation sucks. And like, right. I get it, man. There's a lot of, I, okay. I got to tell a story real quick. There's a kid in my church. Uh, his name's Coda, and Coda is Coda's something something crazy. Like dude's wild. We were sitting at dinner one one week after church, and he's talking to my wife, speaking to her face. And he thought it was so funny. He said, "Yeah, Dylan said he can say whatever he wants to about you on the podcast because you'll never listen." And then he proceeds to tell her stories that I have said on the podcast about <laughs> her, and I'm like, Coda. Bro, I, that's a true statement. Like I told that story knowing she would never hear it, but then you go to her and tell her. So this is for you, Coda. You're no longer allowed to listen to the podcast. Turn it off. <laughs> you're out, dude. You're gone. You're cut off, buddy. Yeah, you're cut off. So Luke Johnson, the man behind Tido Knives. Give us an introduction to Tido, dude. Like how'd you start it? Why'd you start it? Where'd the vision come from? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into why I switched um, and, and just kind of talk about the knife system I want to run. But yeah, give us that, that introduction, dude. Uh, I mean, how it all started, um, this would be our eight year, I think eight years in business this year. Um, me and a few buddies of mine were on our way home from a successful mule deer hunting trip and uh, stopped, dropped. Was it that tanker behind you right there? Not that one. It was a different oh, okay. one. My buddy shot this, the one that I'm talking about here. Oh, um, I gotcha. But stopped at a taxidermist, got to talking to him. Um, he had been using just like a doctor's simple, doctor's scalpel metal handle and blades um, for his taxidermy work. But he also said, you know, I bring these in the field. They're super light. Obviously, sharp blades don't have to sharpen a knife. Um, like we all know about uh, replaceable blade knives. Uh, so I got home from that trip and just went online and bought, you know, a simple scalpel and some blades, um, carried it the rest of that season. That was an early mule deer hunt. The rest of that season, then about halfway through the next hunting season, you know, I was just kind of sitting glassing on a hill and looking at it. And I thought, I could make this better. Like it could be cooler, something you'd be proud to carry. Um, so I got home from that trip, downloaded a free CAD program. Um, don't know how, didn't know how to use it, uh, at all. Just kind of taught myself how to use the program, made up a design, uh, found a local machine shop that could, you know, produce the first couple handles for me and, uh, was off and running from there. Really, um, made some good connections early in the industry, uh, people who just really like my product, um, you know, promoted it on social media and we've been growing ever since. So, um, turning out some now, new products and, and, uh, I remember seeing it and I remember like, I remember thinking to myself and it's funny cause it's exactly what you said. I remember thinking like, man, that's very functional, but it's also cool. Like it's, yeah. Like if people say they don't care about the looks and the style, they're a liar. Like hunters are so feminine when it comes to their camo matching and like what looks cool and what doesn't like, don't tell me that crap. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've been thinking about it recently. It's like, it's something you're proud to carry, proud to own, proud to use. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, you don't want to open up your pack 
you know, in one of the coolest moments of your life, potentially, you know, and pull out some plastic piece of junk that you're not proud of. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, that was, that's a big part of it for me. And yeah, like you said, we all, you know, we got egos, whether you want to say it or not, everybody wants to look cool and, um, be cool and feel cool. And it's just like, if it gives you confidence, it makes you happy, you know, go for it. So, yeah, for sure. Um, so that first knife, that first design, would that be like the finisher or the hollow? That would be the 1.1. Oh, gotcha. The Tito 1.1. It's, I mean, the first, the name came from the first package yeah. we had was 1.1 ounces. Well, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not the brightest, bro. Born and raised in <laughs> Arkansas, dude. Sometimes you got to slow it down for us. Um, so what is the difference between like, cause that's one thing that, um, I remember like, you know, I started working with you not too long ago, made a post and, and got a couple of messages just like, Hey, what, what, what should I go with here? These are dope looking. What is the difference between like the hollow, the finisher, the 1.1, obviously the, the air is, you know, completely different. Uh, yeah. but what are the differences in those replacement blades and why one over the other? So the 1.1 was the original design, um, stainless steel, you know, it's a little bit longer, Just looking up the the overall length is like seven and a half inches. Um, you know, some people are going to want a longer knife. Um, so that was the original design. Um, I thought it fit in my hand really well. That's kind of where the design came up. Um, people have loved that knife. They still love it. It's still one of our top sellers. Um, then from that, we went to the finisher, which was really made to be a little bit more minimalist. And mm -hmm. another big part of it, which I do, you know, when I'm running gun and hunting and maybe like spot and stock antelope hunting is I like to throw it in my bino harness with a couple blades. So if you're not going to be carrying a pack and maybe you get too far away from the truck or wherever you're camping, um, you can have a knife on you to open an animal up, partially break it down or whatever till you can get back to your pack. Uh, that was kind of a reason for that. And then we use titanium as the material on the finisher, um, you know, just to go with a little bit lighter. Um, and really, they're so light, you put them in your vinyl harness or your pack, you, you don't even know they're there. Um, yeah. So as far as replacement blades go, those were kind of the, the first, the 1.1 was the first one. The finisher was our next design. And then this, this hollow bone is our newest um, knife that we just came out with uh, towards the end of last year. Um, and really we put a couple, we could have like a small half handle on it um, just to give a little bit more bulk, still very lightweight. It's a little bit longer than the finisher, but it still will fit in a bino harness um, and a big Big reason for that design was to accept our new blades that we actually um, designed and are manufacturing ourselves, or we're working with a manufacturing partner. Um, so those are our proprietary blades, the HB scalpel blades. And really that hollow bone was made to accept those blades. Um, gotcha. Those blades are a little bit thicker, about as thick as you, we can get um, to get away with still using the same blade retention system. And then they're just... Where the connection point is, is a little bit wider, I guess you'd say on top of the blade, on the opposite side as the cutting edge. Um, that is typically where those blades will break. So we tried to beef that up, uh, you know, so you will blade, break less blades in the field. Um, when you so, start twisting on those, when you start twisting on those replacement blades, that's when you kind of start to get some of that breakage um, yeah. up above there. So it's funny that you say um, you want the lightweight replaceable in the harness because I'm actually the opposite. Um, in my mind, that's the knife I grab all the time. Like if I just need to cut something or, you know, yeah. just that's my that's my tool knife. You know, that's my crap. If I bury a broadhead into the tree, that's what I'm going to dig it out with is the knife right there on my chest. And so I keep the air on my bino harness and yeah. then I'm really only going to pull out the the hollow to, you know, if I get the animal and I get there and I'm ready to, you know, take care of it. Um, so that's why it's in my pack and, yep. you know, in the kill kit. So 
I, I actually view those opposite. Like I want a, I want on my chest, I want a durable, I can do anything and everything with that knife and I don't have to worry about it. I can, you know, yeah, I can get it in a deer if I need to, but I can also, you know, chisel out a broadhead out of a tree yeah. or a fence post or whatever if I need to. So, um, that's what's in my, in my, in my bino harness is the air. And then in, in the pack and the kill kit is the hollow. So, there um, you. What's your what's your tip? What's your advice? Because I haven't I haven't experienced it yet. Okay, actually, let me take a step back. Many of you have heard me say, and I've said this on the podcast before, that I don't like replaceable blades. I want to retract that statement just a touch, because what I used to say is I like a a well hand forged, sturdy built. It's always going to be sharp. It's always going to be ready to roll knife, which is why I like the air. That's what Taito gives you in the air. I wasn't a fan of replaceable blades because usually they're pretty heavy. Like if you look at like an outdoor edge, it's going to be pretty stinking heavy. Um, so it kind of defeats the purpose in my mind of having it in my backpack as, as like my kill kit knife. Yeah. Um, and so then when I started messing with the Taito, man, it's just so lightweight and the blades are easier to change in the field. Um, they're quicker to change in the field. Um, you know, it's just more compact. It fits in a pack better. It's, 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 it's just a, an all around better built knife rather than a cheap plastic folding knife that man, a, I learned one thing over my years. Don't ever have in your kill kit, a folding knife. Cause then you fold it up and inside the mechanisms get disgusting and you can't, you can't ever get the fat and the grease out, you know, where your knife folds and there's hair in it. And it's just, Oh, it's gross. Um, don't ever have a folding knife in your kill kit. That's why I kind of fell in love with the design of Taito. You get a fixed blade. You get, a, or, I'm sorry, you get a, a single piece replaceable blade that's light, it's sturdy, it's well built. So I'm a big fan. Now, what are your tips? What's your tip for getting a blade off and on? You know, you're say you're spring bear, and yeah. you're 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 taking care of the bear. Your hands are all greasy. The knife is greasy from the fat and the blood. What's your tips or advice for changing the blade in the middle of that with the nasty hands? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's always been a challenge of a replaceable blade knife, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, me, myself, I've handled them so much that I just have a technique. You know, really what you got to do is lift that back end of that blade up above the retention and just pull it off. I get that your uh, hands get greasy and whatnot. If your hands are too slippery and greasy to actually get a grip on it and pull, I mean, I've just grabbed a stick and you pry that thing up and you can just push it right off with a stick. It pops right off. So you mean push it off from the backside? Correct. So you pry it up, push it up from the back. Yeah, it could take your fingernail or something, get under it, you pry it up. Once the back of that blade is up, you can just push and it'll just pop yep. right off. I see. I seen a guy and I don't know if he has any uh, connection with you. I don't know. I don't even know if you know who I'm talking about, uh, but he did a video about with your knife about shoving it into a log, uh, okay. like stabbing it into a log. And then that will be the, that will hold the blade. And then you can basically just, you know, pop it off. Well, yeah. I haven't seen that, but log. that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, and it looked like it, it really worked. I haven't tried it yet because I haven't needed to replace my blade. Um, but it looked like it worked well, and I thought, man, that's a that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, and they come – they're so sharp to that tip that they'll pull, push way into a log. I could see how that would work really good. Um, yeah. I'll have to mess with that a little bit myself. That's a great idea. I'd like to see that. Send me that after the podcast. So I, can I will, yeah, for sure. No, because that's what I, I was Googling that, like um, – best way to change it. Cause that is, you know, with, uh, with like the outdoor edge, if you're familiar with those, um, you know, if you've, if, if you're listening, you've ever used those, you're thinking, well, you just unclip it and pull it out. Right. Well, these are a little different. Um, right. these don't have all of those mechanics, which again, a reason I threw those away and never used them because all those mechanics just get gunked up and yeah. disgusting after one animal. Um, I actually, dude, I actually, I threw mine away. Here's when I was done with them. And this was probably, I don't know, four years ago. My middle kid was probably three. And I had shot a deer and I had taken care of it. But that blade was just, 
the knife was so disgusting. The mechanics were so gross. I couldn't fold it back together. And so I just threw it in the bed of my truck. Didn't think much of it. And we're out camping two, three days later. And my kids start screaming, crying. And I'm like, what the heck happened? Like I never even, never even dawned on me because the bed of my truck is full of stuff. Right. And I'm like, what, what happened? And her hand was just destroyed cut. Ugh. And I was like, oh my gosh, she just grabbed that knife. Um, and I was just so fed up with like knives getting gross and not being able to, and, and like, listen, I know that's a hundred percent on me. I know, don't, don't start leaving me negative reviews and negative comments because I left a knife out. I know that, but I left it out because like, it was just so disgusting. I couldn't get it to shut. And it was just so full of junk from that deer. So I just threw it in the bed of my truck. And that's when I was like, okay, I've got to get a knife that you can literally just spray off, you know, and be done. Um, and that's when I, I made the, the, in my mind that those folding cheap replaceable blades, I was done with those. Yeah. Um, but no, it was a good idea. Shove it into a log and then, and then. Yeah. I like that idea. I'll have to, I want to, I want to see that video and I want to test that out a little bit. I can see how that would work. Great. You know, that log grips it enough just to pull it off. Like I said, I don't have many hand, many issues replacing with my hands. Um, I shot a bull elk this year in Wyoming, and it was negative two degrees when me and my buddies were were cutting it up. <laughs> and oh, I was switching blades yeah. off, and it was no problem. Um, so, like I said, I kind of have it down. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Um, like to look at that i'd like to actually get a video like that and maybe put it on our website so that'd be great um another thing when you brought up just blades getting gunked up and that you left that in the back of your truck and your your kid got a hold of it i mean that's one thing that i know i've heard negative on replacement blades is guys will leave them in the field um the the blades uh, that they're they're done mm -hmm. with. Um, that's part of the design you'll see on our uh hb scalpel blades the the bigger blades that fit on our hollow bone knife um they come with a little in a little blade box and it's a perfect spot to put your used blades in so yep. what i do is i run two of those boxes and i have one for clean blades and one for dirty blades and i just throw that in my kill kit so when i'm done yeah. with the blade and it's all dirty instead of pitching it in the grass or whatever where you're at which is obviously a terrible idea you could kneel on it first of all or an animal could get into it or whatever i just put the used blades in the dirty blade box and then grab another clean blade out of the clean blade box yeah um, for so sure that was a that was a part of that design which i've been using which is is great so i know that was that was always a negative um against replacement blades as people leaving those blades all over Changing Blades on Taito Knife Safely by Tony Treach. Tri oh, Tri yeah, I work with Tony. Yep, he put out that video. So, okay, that's um, awesome. Six years ago, um, so guys, just I just searched Taito Knives on YouTube, and it was like the fourth video down. Um, but, yeah, I just saw that, and I'm like, it's actually pretty brilliant. Um, I'll tell you one way. I love talking to knife makers because I treat knives like a tool. It's what they are, you know, yeah. in my mind. So I love talking to knife makers because some of them are like, oh, don't do that to my knife. You know, oh, my gosh, I work so hard on that. And then others are like, yeah, dude, use it and abuse it. That's why you have it, you know. Guys, when it comes to hunting and being outdoors, I believe there's one product that I use more than anything. That's not my bow. That's not my boots. It's not my um, anything else other than a binocular harness. If I am outside doing anything outdoors, I've got a binocular harness on. Whether I'm shooting, whether I'm hanging tree stands, uh, whether I'm out hiking, it doesn't matter. If I'm outdoors doing just about anything, I've always got my binocular harness. Alaskan Guy Creations does it and does it very, very well. I've been using these now for about eight years and i absolutely love them the new system with all the magnets are really good um really accessible very customizable guys if you're in the market for a new binocular harness i would highly 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 encourage you to check out alaskan guide creations because they are phenomenal i used your knife for probably 
three and a half hours the other night stripping four dozen arrows of <laughs> of wraps and veins. And I'm like, God, this is the best knife ever because it's such a little, like you said, it's a scalpel blade. Yeah. It's so little. It gets underneath those veins perfectly and they just popped right off. And I'm like, God, this is awesome. That's funny you say that because forever, even, you know, two years ago when I had still had this company, I was using a, you know, air or arrow defletching tool yeah. or whatever. And then mm -hmm. finally one day I'm like, why am I doing this? I just picked up, <laughs> picked up a knife and a blade and it's just like, wow, this is way easier. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. Unintended, but it's a great tool for that. I use it all the time to, to, uh, take yep. off of arrows. So I did, uh, I did take that blade off and I just put it in my, like my arrow building station that way. Cause that it's already, you know, got glue and sticky on it. And so yeah. that'll be my arrow stripping blade. So no, that's awesome. Nope. I do that too. That's, that's a great use for them. Cool. So let's, uh, so what do you got planned this year, dude? Let's, um, let's talk hunting. You, yeah, uh, you sure. got spring turkey, spring bear. What, what's your, what gets you fired up for spring? Spring, uh, you know, I've done the spring bear thing a few times out in Idaho, which is really fun. Um, I'd certainly like to go back again. Um, like I said, time uh, on my end is not on my side. Um, so this year I'm just uh, going to do some spring turkey hunting locally. Um, Minnesota, we have see, five seasons uh, for shotgun. And basically how it works is you can pick one season and you get to hit hunt that week long season. Um, and then the fifth season, anybody can hunt. Um, yeah. So... The first season's out, just busy. I'm going to be hunting the second season, which ideally this year, you'd be hunting the first season. There's turkeys strutting all over around here. Uh, you know, they're in the neighborhoods and <laughs> it's pretty, yeah, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. So, um, got that going for spring. Um, that's always a fun hunt. You know, for me, I can within an hour and a half of my house, I got lots of public land to go hit. Um, so I kind of just do the run and gun turkey hunt in the woods, you know, not really much for decoying, just, uh, calling and, and moving around. Um, but been really successful in the last few years. I tried for, I think the first couple of years I turkey hunted around here, I was strictly archery. And the last year I archery hunted turkeys, I called eight toms in and did not get a shot. <laughs> so the next year I picked up a shotgun and uh, I have decided turkeys are built for shotguns rather than bows. Yeah. Yeah. So, so <laughs> most people have come to that conclusion, you know, <laughs> Yeah. I had a, I had a guy and he, um, uh, I don't remember who, uh, Oh, it was Warren Holder from raised hunting and he decided to go traditional. And so he'd been asking me all these questions and, you know, I had, I had walked him through arrow setups and broadhead choices and, you know, tuning and I, all of this stuff. And, and dude was shooting good. He would send me videos asking me about form and asking about arrow flight. And, and he said, uh, man, I'm really excited to start using it in turkey season. And I'm like, I, that's not what I would choose to start <laughs> hunting turkeys with. Like, if you want to switch to a recurve, birds ain't going to be what I'm going to switch with, with it on, you know, like, yeah. There are a lot of animals that are built for recurves and turkeys ain't one of them. And so that's what he said. He, he tried it. And I think, you know, he just got busted trying to draw and couldn't and missed a couple and hit a couple. And he's like, yep, this ain't for me, dog. <laughs> I know. I know there's guys that do it, you know, not oh, yeah. outside of a blind run and gun with archery equipment, but I just, I don't know how you don't get busted drawing. Like I, I, yeah. I, I guess I couldn't put that together. I can see sitting in a blind, um, you know, that'd be a great way to kill one with a bow. Um, that's, but just that takes not... away the entirety of why people turkey hunt. Like, yeah, I don't, I will never understand. And I'm not a big turkey hunter. It, you don't have to listen to this podcast long at all to know I'm not a big turkey hunter. Yeah. And most people like I hate on turkey hunting so much on the podcast that most people think it's a joke. And then when I talk to me in person, they're like, dude, I thought you were kidding. I'm like, nope, don't care to turkey hunt. <laughs> But if I'm going to, it's because I'm like, man, I just want to go and run around and chase something. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, it's a, it's a way to get out in the woods in the spring, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's something to do to, to get you out and hone your skills. And, um, you know, 
it's certainly not like calling an elk in. You know, people no. people relate it to that, but it's uh, it's definitely not that. But it's uh, it, it's fun. Like I enjoy it. I mean, I started tree hunting, you know, later. I guess in my life, just for that reason, a way to go hunting in the spring. Um, yeah, see, that's why I it's, hunt. it's been fun. <laughs> it, it's fun to get out, and uh, but I guess I don't take it that seriously. Yeah, for sure. Now I will. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't share this. I don't want to be telling my secrets. This is the first year I've ever done it, but I have done spring bear in Idaho uh, a couple times now. And this year I'm headed to Montana to spring bear hunt. And the buddy that I'm going up there with, I was asking like, dude, how far are you from so-and-so in Idaho? And he's like, uh, just a couple hours. And I'm like, sweet. Cause I have a bear there that I need to go. It's been at the tax service. I need to go pick it up. And he's like, yeah. He's like, well, Hey, why don't we just, we'll shoot a bear here. We'll take that one down to the taxidermist and we'll hunt our way down to the taxidermist and shoot another one in Idaho. And I'm like, why I never thought about that is mind blowing to me. Because if you look at a map, there's really good ground on Montana and there's really good ground in Idaho on the line. So you can just hunt and, and essentially kill an Idaho bear and a Montana bear yeah, without having to do a ton of traveling. And so that's what I'm doing this year. Going to try to knock out two bear tags and one, and one little uh, rodeo there, I guess. Yeah, that'll be cool. That was uh, – the times I went out to Idaho, that was one thought I had. It's like a 25-hour drive to where I was hunting. And one thought I kept having bear. in my head was uh, how many bears am I driving by right now <laughs> to get <Yeah>. here? <laughs> For you sure, know, dude. Probably halfway there. You're in yeah. the country where you could definitely go do the same thing that you're going all the way out to Idaho for. Uh, I mean, you've got a, bears there. Why not bear hunt at home? <laughs> well, they don't have spring bear hunting here. Oh, gotcha. It's fall yeah. only. And so yeah. I'm working on getting a tag here, but every zone's different in Minnesota. Um, the zone that my family has some hunting property in um, – it's six years for a resident to draw a bear tag, which seems a little ridiculous. I mean, we have bears on trail camera pretty much every day. Um, lots of bears, big ones. Um, so, but it's going to take six years. So I think I got three years left before I can draw that bear tag here. Yeah. But that's a fall, fall tag. And, you know, I'm so deep yeah. into getting points and draw system. If I have a year where I draw every tag I apply for, I don't know how I'm ever going to get it done, <laughs> to be honest with You're you. You're right. <laughs> yeah. No, there's – dude, and a lot of people don't know. Like a lot of people don't even think about – there are some stinking giant bears in in eastern states. Oh, yeah. Like Wisconsin is the best state to kill a big old tanker of a bear. Um I think that's where more Boone and Crockett bears have been killed. Like I, th I, I think that I shouldn't have said that for sure, but I think more Boone and Crockett's have been pulled out of Wisconsin than anywhere else. Like, and dude, I have seen some tankers come out of like Oklahoma. Like there's big bears here. Um, but you're right. Like if you want that spring bear and really for me, it's like, man, I want to get in the mountains. Like I want to get in the mountains and chase stuff in the spring. You know, you've been cooped up all winter long and right. it's like, I just want to get out in the mountains and stomp around the mountains and, you know, see some elk and some mule deer and some, and so that's the, really the appeal for me. And I don't know that there's, I don't think there's any States other than in the West that offer spring bear. I think all spring bears out West. I, I think you're right. And, uh, you know, Minnesota, for instance, I mean, there's no, you're sitting over a bay pile. That's that's your only oh, yeah. way to hunt bears in Minnesota, um, as far yeah. as I know. I mean, I don't think you can hunt them with hounds. I know you can't. Um, and there's, you know, there's no spot and stock opportunities. I mean, really, when I really fell in love with big game hunting was, you know, when I was a kid going out to western South Dakota uh, with my dad, you know, um, getting behind some glass and getting to stock some animals on their feet. And that's right. when I was like, oh, this is cool. You don't just sit in a tree and wait because that's you know, yeah. kind of how we were brought up in Minnesota deer hunting. Um, and, and that's the style that that I fell in love with that I love doing. So I've gotten into tree sand hunting a little bit more in Minnesota and I got a good spot. I can go in Wisconsin. Um, but, yeah, what really gets me going is the 
getting on my feet and moving, you know, glass and watching animal behave. Oh yeah, and, for sure. And, and making moves on them. So, um, but that being said, I'd like to, I'd still like to kill a big bear in Minnesota, even if it's sitting in a tree over a bait pile. Right. I got to retract my statement. Um, because the easternmost state offers spring bear, Maine offers spring bear. Okay. Um, but only on certain tribal lands is what this says. Uh, but there's only nine states in the lower 48 that even offer spring bear, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Arizona, Alaska. Oh, I'm sorry. So this isn't just 48. Um, so just nine states in the U S Alaska and Maine only on certain tribal lands. So, uh, Maine does, but, uh, I've bear hunted in Maine and there's like the possibilities of spotting and stalking bears in Maine. Like, oh my gosh insane it's the thickest woods i've ever seen like the north main woods is insanely thick um cool hunting but like i could never i could never imagine trying to spot and stop you can't spot like you no you can only see 30 yards unless you're looking down a road it'd be some sort of still hunting i would i suppose um yeah and i don't know how that would go for bears probably not great <laughs> all right so tell me about the tanker of this buck right behind you um I don't know that I want to say what state I shot in. Even. Um, but uh, no, this is a uh, Badlands buck um, spot that a few buddies of mine have been going out to for probably 10 years when we can draw tags. Um, this trip, it's uh, September is our first trip that we go out there there's usually deer still in velvet um archery hunting obviously spot and stock um but that buck i went and scouted in the summer i think three times out there you know just camped glassed found that deer i think in july when he was still in velvet hunted for a whole week in september Watched him, just never had a chance at him. Um, I think we were out there for nine days in September. Um, came back when I had a chance uh, at the end of October. I think it was October 26th is when I ended up shooting him. Um, some snow had fallen. Um, it's probably three miles from where we were camped to get out to our little glassing spot. Um, the second trip, so that trip, when I actually did get him, I was solo. Um, so there was about two or three inches of snow. Um, I don't know if you've been in Badlands country, but it's that gumbo muck stuff. Oh, yeah. So when that snow starts to melt, it gets pretty dicey. Um, anyways, he was chasing does at that point. So he had moved out of his summer pattern, started to chase does a little bit, um, got to my glassing point where I had been seeing him all through September and in the summer um, that he just had moved in chasing does to a perfect spot to, to get a stock on um, climb down. It was a nasty, nasty little hell hole he was living in. So climb down the, the mud butte down, down to him. Uh, made a good stock could only get within about a hundred yards of him. So I just posted up there, got pinned by a doe for probably a half an hour. She finally called, calmed down, and when she started moving, he came and moved in. Um, ended up just standing broadside, pretty far shot, like 80 yards, um, but he didn't know I was there. Perfectly calm day, um, standing broadside, just checking a doe, and I guess the rest was history on the shot. Uh, made one perfect shot, and he probably ran 50 yards and dumped over. Um, then the work started getting him out of there was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, as I was breaking him down, that couple inches of snow started to melt and the only way in and out of this little hole that he was in is just straight up and down on one of those gumbo mud buttes. And, uh, what year did you say this was? This was let's see, three, four, 2020. I think it was a COVID oh. year. The COVID year. Yeah. A lot of good bucks died in COVID. 
Yeah. I think it was 2020. It had to be 2020. I'm thinking back. I actually wrote an article in Eastman's uh, for this buck. So I think Very it was cool. Eastman's bow hunting journal. It might've been the last, the last uh, bow hunting journal that came out. This buck's in there. Very so cool. You can read the whole story there, but uh, yeah, getting him out of that hole was about the hardest thing I've probably ever done in my life. I mean, you could only, you take a step and slide back. 10 feet, take another step, slide back 10 feet. It was pretty brutal crawling out of there, but, uh, I got him out and there he is. So you should have had him covered in mud. You should have him covered in mud for the taxidermy. Yeah, that would be pretty (laughs) cool. I got some Um, pretty good photos of myself covered in (laughs) mud getting getting him out of there. (laughs) So was, uh, are you, you are you Minnesota born and raised? Yep. So when did the when did the Western uh, you know expansion and when did that start to take place? When did you start going out west? So my dad and a couple of his buddies when they were you know thirty ish, they wanted to do the big West adventure. You know, obviously they didn't have all of the tools that we have now for scouting and whatnot. So they just loaded up a truck and headed out west. Um, I know they hunted Montana a couple years, um, and then they kind of got on some stuff in South Dakota, uh, just knocking on doors and whatnot. They ended up meeting a rancher that was about their age that was kind of taking over his dad's ranch and uh, got to be pretty good buddies with him. Um, and we've been hunting on that ranch ever since. So my yeah. first deer that I ever killed was in Western South Dakota when I was 12 years old. And like from then, from then on, that's what, that's what got me on the Western hunting stuff. So, and then I'd come back, like I said, and try to sit in a tree and it was just like, this isn't fun at all. Especially being a, you know, 12, 12, 13, 14 year old hockey player that's moving all the time. Trying to sit in a tree stand was, was pretty rough. So I remember my first Western adventure and you, it doesn't take long until the thought crosses your head. You're like, man, what I've done my entire life is not hunting. Mm-hmm. Like now don't get me wrong. I'm still a whitetail fanatic. I love whitetail hunting. Um, but there, you just, you learn something when you go out West and you're like, holy crap, we've got five days to do this. And this is the first time my boots have hit the ground. Like, yeah. you know, it's just so much different and it's a different ball game because with whitetails, you know, really the hunt takes place all summer long with cameras and where you're going to set up and where you're going to hang out, hang your set. And then it really just becomes a waiting game as to, yeah. are they going to come by here? Um, and so it's a, it's a different ball game. There, there's joys to both. I love both. Um, but I remember like being on the mountain for the first time and like, okay, I saw a bear at a mile and a half away. Now what? Like, yeah, this is actually hunting. Um, but it's interesting to me because, you know, a lot of guys, that kind of Western expansion of, of, of Eastern hunters, basically anything Colorado and, and East, um, really, you know, you hear most people talk and it's kind of a new thing, I, relatively new, at least, you know, of we're going out West to hunt. And I think it's because exactly what you just said, because technology has made it easier for us to do so. Right. Like, whereas, you know, when, when our dads were kids, it's exactly like you just said, you know, dad wasn't going to drive 40 hours and try to shoot something. And he had no idea where he was going, how he was going to do it or where it was at. Whereas now we have all of these tools and all these resources to know where can I park the truck when I get there? Where can I camp when I get there? I can have glassing spots saved. I can have, you know, potential bedding areas saved. I can have, you know, you can make a plan before you get there. And so, Uh, I think that's really what, you know, cause I've had these conversations a lot because Western people are like, where the crap did y'all come from? Like you used to not come here. Now, 20 years ago, you just started flooding our States. Well, the more and more technology rolls out, the more and more guys think I could probably do that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there were maps, there were plat maps that had landowners mm-hmm. and state land and uh, whatever national forest land marked on it, but it was a lot more difficult, right? You had to put a lot more research in, you had to know how to read maps really well, you know, 
So it was possible and the stuff was there, but now it's just so easy. You know, you bring up your Onyx maps or, or whatever mapping system you got and, you know, it's marked clearly who owns every plot of land and what land you can hunt on and what land you can't. And, um, you know, Google Maps, you can go basically look at exactly what it's going to be like when you get out there. Um, you can mark yeah. spots and rather than just looking at a topo map, I mean, if you didn't know how to read maps 30 years ago, there's you, you wouldn't know anything about what your spot right. was going to look like when you got out there. Um, well, I, you know, I think it's not only just maps and technology, but we just live in a knowledge based world now. And, right. and even with podcasts, dude, like, you know, if I'm on a plane, I'm sitting there digesting information. Like I'm sitting there learning about where I'm going hunting. Or learning about the species I'm hunting. Like, you know, it's getting close to spring bear. So I've started downloading a whole bunch of spring bear podcasts. Like yeah. just to start learning techniques and do's and don'ts. And uh, Remy Warren put out a, a podcast not too long ago about like the do's and don'ts of spring bear. And so like you're just sitting there constantly digesting and learning and growing. You got YouTube. You've got TVs littered with, you know, streaming channels about hunting and podcasts and <laughs> archery talk and rock slide and so really if you're wanting to go somewhere like there's you can learn about it like through yeah. youtube podcast rock slide you can ask people you can it's just we live in a wealth uh, in a in a society that is giving out knowledge more than they used to you know used it, to it was i don't want to share my stuff with anybody it's a lot quicker too right it's not oh yeah <laughs> you don't have to you don't necessarily have to go find out for yourself, which I still think is the best way to learn, um, whether it's shooting a bow, tuning a bow, uh, learning animal behavior, learning land nav, learning the terrain you want to hunt. I mean, the best way to do it is to get out there and actually do it. But you can get that knowledge base really quick before you go make that next step. Um, yeah, which has changed everything, you know, right. Um, even in the last 10 years where I go hunt public land, like it's exploded with people. Like I used to be, yeah. able, to be able to get out and be by myself. I mean, that's pretty rare now. Um, right. You're constantly running into somebody. Oh yeah. And I mean, some of it's good. I used to get, I don't know if upset's the right word, but I used to get flustered when there'd be other people hunting the same piece of property or piece of land as me. But I've gotten to the point where it's just like, this is how it is. So if I see somebody at the trailhead that I want to go into, I just go talk to them. You know, yeah, where 100%. are you going to go? You know, if you're going to go over here, then I'll go over here. Let's work together on this now at this point. Yeah. I mean, what else are you going to do? There's no reason to to fight it i guess at this point still i'd love to try to get away from the people and and be out there by myself that's ideal but uh at the end of the day you're gonna run into people and you might as well work with them maybe they'll help help you pack out your big bull you just shot um, guys i'm a big believer in prioritizing your feet your feet should always be a priority and you should always be considering what's on your feet if you're in the mountains and you've got blisters and hot spots. You are not going to go as far. You're not going to make it to that next ridge. You're not going to stay on the mountain as long. Ultimately, you're not going to be as successful. If you're sitting in a whitetail stand and your feet are freezing, you're going to get more jittery. You're not going to be as still. You're not going to be as quiet. You're not going to stay as long. Ultimately, you're not going to be able to kill that big buck in the dead of winter. If you're chasing antelope, you've got to be able to be quick and quiet and fast and have comfortable feet. Guys, no matter what you're chasing, no matter the pursuit, no matter the game, your feet should be a priority. I have fallen in love with Schnee boots. I didn't even know how normal hot spots and blisters were in my life until I got a good pair of boots because I was probably a lot like you. I would run to a, a Cabela's Bass Pro and I would buy a pair of $100 boots thinking that I was saving money. But those boots break down faster and I got to keep buying boots. So guys, don't let a pair of $400 boots keep you from buying good boots because in the long run, those $100 boots, they add up. Whereas if you spend 
good money on a good pair of Italian made handcrafted boot. They're going to last you for 10, 15 years. They're going to be way more comfortable. You're going to be more successful. Your feet will be more comfortable. You will thank me later. So guys go check out schnees.com for all of your boots. That's S C H N E E S.com. The best boots on planet earth. Schnee boots. Go check them out. Thank me later, but guys start prioritizing your feet and get yourself a good pair of boots. That's it. That's exactly what I was going to say. I heard a story about a guy and he fell and broke his leg way out in the, in the mountains and another hunter that he had met on the trailhead going in sees him comes, helps him. And he's like, man, this story could have ended up a lot different. Had I been a jerk to the dude. Like yeah. had, had we fought and yelled at each other and, you know, I said, get off th- this is where I'm hunting. You know, I got here first. Anyways, had that conversation went different earlier in the day, my life could have turned out a lot different. Like, so I'm thankful that, you know, I talked to the guy and we, because we're on the same stinking team, you know what right. I mean? Like we're, we're all playing the same game. We're all on the same team. And I remember, and what, it's exactly what you just said. One time I, so I hunt. One of my one of my properties here in Kansas, the southern border of that property is Oklahoma. Okay. Um, so like the road I'm parked on, the little tractor path I'm parked on separates uh, Kansas and Oklahoma. And a few days in a row, I had seen this truck parked in that same little tractor path. This is not a road. Like you don't you don't go down there just because you're chilling. So I knew the dude was hunting, uh, and I knew he was hunting the Oklahoma side because I had I had the Kansas side. And so finally I see him and we're hunting the same deer. Like we've got pictures of the same deer. I mean, we're hunting, you know, hundreds of yards from each other. Same, same deer, same trophies, same sheds. We had been chasing the same deer. And I was kind of worried about how this conversation would go, but we meet and, you know, we're talking and went really good. And so like the next couple of days we're walking in together. Like we're just, we're, we're walking down the tractor path. I would go to the Kansas side. He would go to the Oklahoma side. And it was, you know, hey, good luck this morning, man. You know, let me know if you need any help. And we just, we built a relationship. Like, cause there's, there's, whether I like it or not, he's hunting there. Like, yeah. and whether I like it or not, my target buck might walk in front of him. Now, I don't like it because they get a couple weeks before me for rifles. So they're <laughs> shooting rifles when I'm still bow hunting. But anyways, and then one time I get stuck and I mean stuck, stuck. And there's no cell phone service. And I'm like, crap, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, and there's no houses. I mean, I got, I would have to walk five miles. Yeah. And I mean, I'm stuck, stuck. And I see the guy and I'm like, oh my gosh, this couldn't have, this couldn't be better. Like, because I really, you know, I was in that point where I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I mean, obviously I wasn't going to die, but I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do here. And sure enough, he pulls me out and we go on our way. It pays to not be a jerk. Like <laughs> yeah. you're all fighting on the same team. You're all hunters. Like you can't stop them from killing the buck, whether you're nice to them or hate them, you know, so you might as well be kind. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my mentality now. Like I said, when I was younger, it was a little bit less that way, but I was running into less people too. Um, so you'd think you'd have your deer figured out and somebody would come in and, you know, I guess I would, wouldn't handle it as good as I do now, but I mean, this, Last October, the the elk I was talking about earlier um, that I had killed, it was the same deal. I mean, we were there for seven days and didn't, I think, well, six days and didn't see an elk. And everybody we ran into, you know, we're all at the point where nobody's seen anything. So we're at the point where you run into somebody and we just start sharing information, like, what have you seen? What do you think they're doing? Some of the people were local. Some of them weren't. Um, we met a really cool guy that I'm still in contact with uh, yeah, from Florida that was there. And, you know, we kind of put our heads together. And I had some information from somebody else I know about this unit. Um, and he, there was a drainage. We knew these elk were going to come off of the mountain when the weather hit, which it was gonna hit it was 85 degrees when we got there and like i said it was negative two uh when i ended up killing that bull but uh you know we put our heads together he went and hunted one side of the drainage we went and hunted the other side of the drainage and we ended up basically just waiting them out um but yeah sharing information with him you know ended up kind of 
getting a bull on the ground for us. Um, you know, yeah. we work together instead of turning our backs on each other or fighting with each other. And, uh, it worked out for us. So, yeah, for sure, man. And that's what like knowledge is free, <clears throat> like information right. and help is free. And there's enough deer, there's enough bulls, there's enough ducks, you name it, whatever you like to hunt turkeys. There's enough to go around. Like, yeah. because I tell someone a little bit of information about what I've seen or what I've witnessed or, you know, because it used to be so much different. It used to be like, I mean, even information that wouldn't affect you at all, but it's like, no, nah, dude, I figured this out myself. Like, this is mine. Yeah. I'm holding on to this. Like, information is free. Knowledge is free. Help is free to give out. And there's enough to go around. And well, I'll never especially forget. Especially if you're already in a spot. It's not like it's yeah. a secret, right? You guys are both already there. <laughs> you yeah. might as well work together at this point. I'm probably not yeah. going to go share my uh, waypoints with everybody. But uh, if I'm there and you're there, we're, I'll work with you for sure. Guys, you, hey, share your email. And if you want his waypoints, you just email <laughs> him over. He'll say, No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, man. And that's what I'll never forget. My dad, one time I've been hunting this deer and I've been hunting this deer hard. I mean, hard and it died. Somebody else killed it. And I, I was mad. Of course I was 17 years old. S yeah. 17. And I was mad, dude. I mean, this was cause I grew up in Northwest Arkansas. It was a giant deer for the area. You didn't have a chance to hunt deer like this often. And I was mad and I'll never forget my dad. Um, and it died like a ways away from where I was hunting. So my dad was like, dude, how many people do you think were hunting that deer? Like, you're not the only person that thought you had laid claim to that deer. Right. And I was like, well, true. He's like, dude, between us and that and where it got killed, 40 people had trail camera pictures of that deer and th thought that was their deer. But he said, and I'll never forget this. He said, Dylan, I don't think that if you're a true sportsman, you can be upset because somebody else had success. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, a lot of truth to that. Like, if you're upset because of somebody else's success, you might not be a sportsman. You know what I mean? You might just be a selfish, greedy killer. Like, because as outdoorsmen, like, I should be proud of somebody. Yeah, I can be upset. I can be, oh, man, I've been hunting that deer for so long. I'm not telling you can't be sad. Like, right. you've invested a lot of time and money in that deer. But if you're mad that somebody else has success, man, you need to start asking yourself some questions. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's the way to look at it. It's they took it ethically. They worked hard for it. Probably <laughs> there's all yeah, obviously hope. those stories where, uh, <laughs> you know, the Elmer Fudd drinks beer all night and goes out on opening morning and kills oh, a yeah. trophy buck, which is hard to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if we're all playing by the same rules, it is what it is. You know, yeah, they got it. You, they're, they're wild animals, right? They're not, uh, they're not doing what you want them to do all the time. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, no, my, uh, my boss at Pope and young, um, his wife is a bad to the bone hunter. And he was telling me a story and she shoots this freak of a deer. I mean, just giant deer, giant fork and horn buck. And, uh, they're in Montana and, like they shoot it and this guy comes up like while they're taking care of it. He's like, I've been hunting this deer for weeks, months, years. I don't, I don't know how long it was. <laughs> and he's like, sad. He's like, can I take pictures with your buck? <laughs> and so, so my boss is like, so this guy took pictures of my wife's deer. <laughs> and, uh, but he, but he, he did say, no, he was happy for us, but yeah. he said, how long have you guys been hunting him? He said, uh, we saw him about seven minutes ago and killed him <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah. He said, he said, man, I, I didn't want to be a butthead, but I really wanted to ask him like, how does it make you feel that you've been trying to kill it for a year and a half and my wife kills it in seven minutes. Like <laughs> that's, uh, that's how it works sometimes, you know? Yeah. The right sure. place at the right time. Yeah. No, I, for I sure. did. Uh, I, and on the flip side of that, I had an argument with, um, one of my, one of a neighboring property to a property I hunt. And, um, they were freaking out that, that we were hunting there. And I said, dude, listen, first off, we both only have one tag a year. So if you're going to hunt the biggest, most mature deer in the area, and I'm going to hunt the biggest, most mature deer in the area, we're, we're not going to do anything, but help the herd. Like we're not going to do anything, but increase each other's hunting. Now, if, if you go out and shoot fork and horns and I go out and shoot, you know, yearlings, 
yeah, we need to talk about this. But if we both agree that we're going to hunt big mature deer and, and let little ones walk and grow, we're not going to do anything but help each other. And I said, yeah. but also, dude, and I don't mean to offend you because I don't know you. I said, but my wife is hunting this with a compound. My wife is hunting with a compound. You're sitting in a tower blind with a rifle. If she's a threat to you, you need to check yourself. Like <laughs> I said, I'll never even set this property. I picked up this lease strictly for my wife to have a place to come and set. Yeah. So if my wife with a compound bow and a tree stand is a threat to you and a tower blind with a rifle over a feeder, we've got issues. Like yeah. check yourself, bro. <laughs> But that's how it goes, man. Yeah, that white whitetail hunting is a little goofy. I mean, uh, especially here, most most people are hunting on pretty small properties, and the problem that we're having is, you know, we got a decent sized property, and we've been managing it for I don't know ten. 10 plus years, got some food plots going, did, did some hinge cutting, trying to make some bedding areas. And it's just, if you can't get everybody around you on board with what you want to do, that's the hard part. So, I mean, our three-year-old deer, two-year-old deer walk off our property and get shot by the next guy. And it's just, mm -hmm. we're trying to develop relationships with them, but you know, everybody has a different view of hunting, right? Um, if you're rifle hunting for one weekend a year, you're probably going to shoot some if it has antlers on it that walks by you. And that's what yeah. a lot of these people are doing. So we're, you know, we're doing our best to manage our property, but you know, a deer walks off. You don't know what's going to happen. You can't really keep them right. there. I mean, we're doing our best to keep them there. Um, and that's all move. we can do. Yeah. Yeah, that's all we can do. And, you know, I've told people that too. Like when you talk to neighboring properties, you're like, listen, I'm going to hunt, you know, the biggest, most mature deer I can hunt, blah, 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 blah. And I even told one guy, I said, but listen, my son's five and he's going to start hunting in a couple of years. Yep. And if he sees a forking horn and he wants to shoot that deer, it's what he's going to shoot. And and I'm sorry. Hard to be but mad. But it's his tag. Hard to be mad about that. Yeah, exactly. But like – you still want to have those conversations because again, it's, you know, it's, Hey, your property, your rules, you can hunt however you want. This yeah. is how I'm going to hunt it. It's your tag. I'm not going to tell you how to fill it. You don't tell me how to fill my tag, you know, but let's all work together for the betterment of this herd. And that's what, you know, that's what, uh, that's what it should all be about. Like, Hey, I want to enjoy hunting, but I also want to see the deer in my area. I, I want to see them thrive. And so if that's the case, like, there are some things I need to do. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, in that mentality, I mean, my mentality has changed a little bit. I've, I've always wanted to kill mature deer, but as I've gotten older, I can sit, I can watch deer walk by. I can let them walk if they're not something I'm looking for. And to be honest, archery whitetail hunting in Minnesota and Wisconsin, I mean, I haven't killed a buck for quite a few years but I'm seeing a lot of them, right? I'm just waiting for that big deer. And I've been hunting a couple specific deer on these properties. And if it's not what I'm looking for, I'm going to let it walk. And it's been a little frustrating because I haven't filled the tag for a while. Um, and I've put quite a bit of time in, but that's, that's how, it, that's how it's going to be. If you want to, if you want to develop that property and that deer herd, and if you want to take mature deer, sometimes it's going to be hard and you're going to have to let them walk. That's been, that's been my struggle. Um, you know, what's even harder <laughs> is realizing sometimes the deer I need to shoot doesn't have the biggest antlers. Like oh, yeah. that's the hardest part. That's true. like, if you, if you realize, man, I've got this seven and a half, eight and a half year old deer and he's not special up top, right. but for the betterment of my herd, that's the deer I need to kill. That's when it gets really hard. Yeah, And I had that exact situation in Oklahoma last year. I had two deer standing in front of me. One's a gorgeous 150, four and a half. One's a ugly, raggedy old 110 that's like seven and a half, eight, eight years old. And I'm like, oh. And so I plug an arrow in the one that's 110 inches. Yeah. And I'm and there's a camera on both of them. And people are like, why in the crap did you shoot that one? And I'm like, because if I want this deer herd to thrive, that's the one I needed to shoot. Like, yeah, it's not as special up top, but right. you know, that deer, and now you see pictures of the deer that I pass, and it's like, oh, yeah, 
I'm glad I passed him. Um, but, and that's, you know, that, that just takes growing and maturing as an outdoorsman and as a sportsman. Um, and I think we're starting to see a lot more of that too. And, and, yeah. and again, I equate that back to the knowledge base era that we live in because you've got guys sharing really good information about, you know, how to grow a deer herd and about killing mature deer. And so we're seeing a lot more of that too, because dude, you didn't let deer 30 years ago. You didn't let deer walk. There's one in front of you. Kill it. You know? Yeah. That's uh you know, that's a big thing. Like in Minnesota where obviously I'm from and I've been hunting my whole life. Everybody's goes out and hunts, you know, first weekend of rifle, maybe the second weekend, maybe a couple days in between. And I got an eight pointer and they're all happy. Or I got a 10 pointer. It's like, well, what I need to know a little bit more else about this deer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He could be an eight pointer. That's two years old. <laughs> that, yeah. You didn't really do much. Um, yeah. That's what, yeah, that's what's so funny. Like you said, and now people are learning more. They're understanding different age classes of deer, getting better at, at aging deer, knowing the, mm. the right animals to take. And I think it's all, it's going to help us all out for sure. That's what I love that too, because, um, my, my daughter, my 12 year old, all of her little friends at school, um, like think I'm cool. Cause I get to hunt a lot, you know? And it's funny. Cause my daughter said, uh, like they'll ask him, they'll ask her and she, she has no idea, but they'll ask her like, how many points did that deer your dad kill have? And I'll say it was eight and she'll come back the next day. They said it was just eight. And I'm like, well, it was 145 inch eight. Like that's a big eight. Like, yeah. like they don't understand Well, he was six and a half years old and you know, 145 inch eight. They just know like points. There's a lot more that and, goes into it. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's what like, I do kind of miss that too of like, you know, back in the day it was either yes or no, like, yep, I punched a tag or no, I didn't, you know, you were either a yes or a no. Now it's, well, how big was he inches wise? How big was he point wise? How old was he? You know, and it's so much more to it now, uh, yeah. but it makes the chess match funner. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just wanted to go kill an animal, you probably, once you get to a point, you probably wouldn't hunt that much, right? You'd go out there right. and you'd be done and you wouldn't get to hunt anymore that year. You'd punch your tag yeah. and that would be it. Um, I mean, that being said, I love wild game meat. So I do like to get a few things down every year. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> Keep that free. And that's fun. what, um, <laughs> so Coda, if you're still listening, if you didn't follow my rules um, and you're still listening, you know, we took Coda out this year hunting and uh, the first time we set, it got dark. And I said, all right, bud, let's roll out. And he said, but we hadn't even, we hadn't shot a deer yet. And I'm like, yeah, but it's dark. Like we can't shoot no more. And so I was just trying to, you know, tell him like, man, that would, hunting would kind of suck, dude. If you just killed something the first try every time, like wouldn't be fun. Wouldn't, wouldn't be a challenge. Wouldn't be fun. I wouldn't do it, do it much longer at all. No. Um, but again, that's just growing as a sportsman, like understanding, man, I love the chase. Like, I just love being out here. I love seeing animals. I love witnessing the sunrises and the sunsets like i love i love watching the rut like i used to tag out before the rut and then i'm like man i don't even get to hunt the rut no more yeah. like i just it, it's growing and it's maturing as a sportsman and understanding all those things so yeah i mean i guess a few of my favorite hunts were uh when i tagged out early and then just got to help my buddies um and go a hundred percent the rest of the week um, I always, those are some of my most memorable hunts, a hundred percent, even whether I, even some hunts where I didn't even have a tag and I was just tagging along and, you know, playing guide. Um, those are some of the, my best memories that I have of hunting, um, Absolutely, outside, dude. helping somebody else fill a tag. Um, that's, I love doing that too. So. I, I can 100% say that if, if I look through my trophy room, my biggest, my favorite trophies, the best memories not one of them is the biggest, not one of them, not one of those is because it's the biggest antler wise. Right. And I like it that way. Like, man, and I've shared the story probably three times. So I don't want to share it again, but last year when I shot a buck with my son in the blind for the first time, he's five. Like it was unreal of an experience. And, and we're talking mid one thirties. I mean, nothing, nothing crazy special, but it was like, mind-blowingly fun with my son there and him being so excited like 
it's not all about size of antler. Now that was a deer that needed to be shot. He was a big mature deer needed to be shot. Um, but man, like as I look through there and, and it used to not be that way, it used to be, well, that's the biggest, so that's the best, you know? Right. But now you just understand there's so much more to this game than antler size, you know? Yeah. Agreed. So sure. man, Luke, thanks for the conversation, dude. I didn't, uh, didn't know we were going to go down the, the maturing as a sportsman route, but no, I guess we did. Right. So. Wherever it goes, <laughs> that's what's fun about podcasts, right? Yeah, for sure. It's just a where can they find? Where can they find Tito at? Uh, www.titoknives.com. And uh, wait, are Tito you weren't even going to tell me I was saying it wrong end. this entire time. Well, it's there's two different camps. There's Tito and there's Tito. You know, people say it two different ways. I guess it doesn't bother me at all. But you're but you get to make the rules. You you thought of the name. You thought of everything about the company. Yeah, I don't know. You can make your own rules. <laughs> Just enjoy the knives. <laughs> oh, I definitely enjoy the knives. So, um, yeah, our website is titoknives.com, Instagram, Tito Knives. Um, we're coming out. We'll have some new products coming out yet this year. And starting in May, we're going to try to do Ooh. we're going to try to do this every month. We got other new products, but this starting in May, we're going to try to do some custom drops once a month. So it'll probably be a small run of custom knives that are going to have going to be completely one of a kind. So different finishes, different handles. Um, you'll nice. see some different designs. Um, there'll be fixed blades and replacement blades in those. Um, so those will be pretty cool. Um, hopefully we're going to get our first one done uh, right around May 1st for the custom drops. Um, and then a couple Sweet. other new cool products uh, in the hopper here too. Yet this year, they're making a new uh, they're making a new arrow stripper uh, knife. Yeah, and it's basically going to be the exact same <laughs> knife, just just rebranded for you. So yeah, there you go. That'll be perfect. <laughs> so. Uh, guys, also don't forget that um, we have our elk hunt giveaway going on right now with uh, Mountain Tough and Bear Archery. So go get entered to win. Completely paid for elk hunt guided elk hunt in idaho with myself this september you get an elk tag and a bear tag we're covering all your tags licenses guide fees everything all your meals lodging all of that all you gotta do is get there so make sure and go enter to win that if you need to find that just go to my instagram Baron's instagram mountain tough you'll find it somewhere uh but we're gonna give away a free elk hunt with a mountain tough subscription and a bear bow completely set up ready to roll so go enter to win that guys i don't need to tell you about the blazer vein you're probably familiar with the blazer vein and you're probably familiar with boning boning has been around forever it's a name you can trust they sell products you can trust they have everything that you need to build your own arrows all of the jigs to, to fletch your own arrows all of the veins all of the wraps the countless numerous types of veins and wraps to build any kind of configuration you want they also have some really cool Fred Bear branded products with their Fred Bear camo wraps and their Fred Bear flannel wraps. Something that's really cool about that Fred Bear flannel, that's actually a photo that was taken of one of Fred Bear's flannel uh, famous shirts, you know, the red and gray and black that he always wore. That's actually a photo taken of his personal shirt and put on a wrap. It looks really cool, especially on some traditional arrows. But my very favorite configuration, and this is coming from an arrow junkie that's tried out all different kind of veins and all different kind of configurations. I have found that this configuration stabilizes pretty much every arrow. It's whisper quiet. They fly fantastic. The three inch Bronco vein in a four fletch absolutely flies like a dart, whether you're shooting mechanicals or big fixed this is going to be a fletching configuration that will work again whisper quiet long range accuracy i love this configuration this is on every single one of my compound arrows they just work guys i would highly encourage you to check out boning not just for the blazer vein but for the heat vein for the broncos for the x veins everything um that you need to build your own arrows is right there on boning's website they've been around for ages and i promise you if you order from them you're going to get products that you can trust. Make sure and stay tuned on Tito Knives Instagram. I'm going to start saying it right because I respect <laughs> you as a man and I'm going to respect your wishes. Tito oh, Knives yeah. on Instagram for some custom drops. You're going to want to see them. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Y'all have a fantastic week. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Dylan.